Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top selling authors and the up and coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Frank Nischt, author of Cockroaches and Crickets Learning to Love Creatures That Skitter and Jump. It's published by Greystone. It'll be released in March. Frank is an entomologist. He's a science reporter and filmmaker who has studied insects around the world. Uh, this century, from 2000, he's been working as a journalist and a director of TV documentaries, including award-winning nature and animal films, and he lives in Cologne. So we hate cockroaches, or many of us do. They raid the kitchen till we turn on the lights and then they skitter all at once to the walls, the cabinets, the floorboards. They look disgusting, again, to some. They're scary. And I feel like they smell like almonds or cyanide when you crush them between your feet as they make an oddly satisfying yet nightmarish crunch between the sole of your boot and the cement of the basement. But we like crickets, crickets at the hearth, little cricket cages to keep them as pets. They make sitting on the porch in your rocking chair in the twilight on a warm summer's eve that much more pleasant. <clears throat> we even have fond memories of Geppetto and Jiminy Cricket taking care of Pinocchio with the help of the Blue Fairy. But they may eventually drive you crazy with their, their incessant chirping. And grasshoppers are stronger for their size than any human athlete. Were they our size, they literally would be able to leap tall buildings with a single bound. Hell, if these creatures were our size, the cockroaches, they'd wipe us out, as we seem to be doing to them, but in an instant. And of course, there are all the old wives tales of cockroaches surviving a nuclear blast, drought, cold, and pretty much everything, unchanged by Mother Nature and its evolutionary processes uh, for hundreds of millions of years. And so here to tell us why we should love them is Frank. Thanks so much, Frank, for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here, yes. So I guess the easiest way to begin is the first line of your book, which says, they're so disgusting. So you said that as the first line. So why is that, do you think? I think you quote uh, the, the pre-title of uh, Carl Safina. Oh, uh, no. Not my words, it's his words, but <laughs> I think also him, um, means it uh, quite ironically, but it is it is true. If I had cockroach in my apartment, I would call uh, somebody to get rid of them because that's self defense, and nobody wants to have them in their apartments. And I can understand everybody who doesn't want. But it is a very interesting case. You know, you quoted me. Everybody hates. Uh, cockroach but everybody loves crickets but when you look at them they are almost the same um a cockroach is like a cricket who can't sing but the rest is almost the same they eat the same things they are quite related and so what does an animal make interesting to us or cute or lovable or some uh, what 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 is it and I think it's because we we are looking in, in for something when we are thinking about animals. We are looking for a best friend or for some humanity, for human feelings. And and you in with the crickets, you have an animal that can sing that makes a, a sound that pleasures us. But in the cockroach, you can't find anything <laughs> that's. Um, yeah, that uh, brings you to this point that you want to, to, to like this animal. But I am a biologist and we biologists, we think about life. Biology is a science of life. And so maybe there are more interesting stories in the cockroach than perhaps in the pony or the fox. You don't, you don't know before you start um, uh, making science about it. And that's one of the things that I found very interesting in your book, when you do that little paragraph or two about how, wait a minute, cockroaches may be very similar to us. 
they actually have moved in with us and that's where they want to stay. Yes. And they take care of their offspring and they are given milk as human babies are. And you recite some other similarities, which some people, given the fact that they, <laughs> they aggregate on a pile of their own feces, um, might, you know, take exception to. Yeah, I think there's some something everybody has to know before judging. There are about 4,000 or 5,000 uh, species of cockroaches known to, the, um, to science. And there are only some who give milk to their offspring. The pests we have in our apartments, they don't do that, yeah? So I, um, it's, it's like we have 4,000, 4, 4 to 5,000 um, species of mammals, but we don't judge them when we look only on mice who eat our food or I don't know, other um, animals who harm us. We, we judge them because of the monkeys and the elephants and stuff like that. And so we judge cockroach by only the around 10 to 20 species who make trouble to us. But there's so many other species, some who are parents, who give milk, who feed their offspring, who are um, in bright colors and stuff like that. But I don't want to appear as a nerd who loves cockroach. I love animals. I love nature. And I, I want to make people aware of the millions of interesting stories that can be found uh, out there. One of the things you just mentioned about species, for me as a lay person and the lay people who will be reading this, who buy from my bookstore, it's interesting that you cite, I think it's Richard Dawkins about the, the selfish gene. Yes. And I was thinking about that because a lot of people don't understand the three different reasons why a species is different from another species. And you talk about it genetically. And it was so fascinating because you're saying the genes alone could not survive unless they had a structure within which to live. Yes. It's, it's almost like Sartre. It's almost like existentialism, you know? Yeah, but, but that's how we biologists look on the world. But in the same chapter, I say there are no genes that can create culture. Yeah, there are no genes that can create um, a Mozart opera or or something else like that so that is only our view on life how life survives and develops and it is like that you have these big molecules the dna yeah and and if there's no energy um brought to this uh, molecule and if there are uh, enzymes who re repair this big molecule it will die so everything um, the, the structure around it is to feed the genes. That's the only purpose for the cockroach to be there, and maybe for the human beings too. But uh, but that's a very biological view on it. And um, but it's not the only view I have on on life and on on culture or something like that. Yes. Talk a little bit. About, I jumped ahead a bit. But talk a little bit about your first laboratory days when you were and you and I were much younger and um, a, a couple of things like the cockroach tsunami would be an interesting thing to talk about and, and how that came about because it shows how smart they are. Yes. Um, yes, smart is maybe not the right word, but um, they have this, yeah, um, how you say in English, um, I start from 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 the beginning. Um, when I wanted to work, uh, to to write a book about cockroaches, I wanted to to write a book that's a little bit funny too. So I I remembered all the fun stories during my um, time in the in the lab in Cologne, and uh, we have had a, a room where uh, the cultures were where the, um, the we we grew the cockroach for our for our science. And it was infested by 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 cockroach, and and so uh, many many came uh, in, into other labs of our colleagues, and they got mad and told us, "Get rid of your cockroach! Uh, it's disgusting here." And so 
we thought, how can we do that? We, and so we tried to kill them with heat. And uh, there was this, this room where all these cartridge were, were inside and we put in very strong heaters to, um, yeah, to get rid of this problem. But after one hour, we opened the door and there came this cockroach tsunami, uh, tsunami and, and all the cockroaches went into the building and, and the problem was much bigger than before. But what happened? Um, they have strong senses. They, they could um, sense the cold air coming into from the, the door, from the cracks in the door. And so all the coverage went there. We biologists call this a taxis. Uh, they they uh, orientated to uh, the cool air. And so they survived. And we like, yeah, we, we didn't stop evil. We, we, uh, we helped evil to spread over the world. <laughs> But it's like that. I like to tell stories. I like to tell uh, stories about my work, my life, combine it with uh, science and interesting facts about uh, insects. So that's that's how this book works. Yeah, my book. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good. I'm glad you held it up. Okay, like this, yeah. Oh, mother. Ah, like this, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a great, it's a great cover. And as a bookseller, I'm always interested in covers because my customers are as well. Um, the other story you talk about, well, you know, you have lots of friends who think because you're the expert in cockroaches, you can solve their problems in their homes. And mm -hmm. that woman who called you about her parchment paper, and you were confused at first, but the explanation is kind of almost like a horror movie, but fascinating as well especially mm -hmm. the injection into the three sections, which a biologist wouldn't be able to figure out on his own. Talk about that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was like that, that I got a call from a friend and she said, there's some kind of mess in my kitchen. And she told me that there are like um, spiders in that drawer, how do you say, drawer? And, and uh and little spiders and little things like little holes and uh, and a wasp uh, was coming out and i remember that i read uh, some books of a french entomologist jean henri fabre and uh, he he has written in the 19th century about the behavior of uh, digger wasps and these wasps they they know how to paralyze their prey. They sting um, with their stinger. They sting inside in other insects and bring these insects to a place where they lay their egg. And then this prey is not dead. And so it stays fresh until um, their young hatch from the eggs. And this was a special digger wasp, wasp that is new to Europe. It, uh, it is introduced from Asia. And so I could solve this uh, little uh, problem by remembering uh, reading Jean-Henri Fabre. And I wanted to, in this chapter, I wanted to write about this man, Jean-Henri Fabre, because he's kind of a, a hero, a personal hero because he he really yeah writes uh, he wrote so perfectly nice uh, it's big literature and you also also all, the most of the biological facts are true so it is uh, it is really a pleasure to read Fabre it's like two thousand pages of uh, behavior of of insects he has written mm. I'm glad you mentioned him because because I was researching, I looked him up in Fabra and his his home that he called Armas, Arma, which means fallow ground in English, you know, ground that you can grow things in easily. And then also he was a painter. He seems like such a nice person, doesn't he? Yes, yes, yes. And I always thought there are old photographs of him and he appears here, he wore a big head and only black uh, clothing. And I always, thought he looks like a monk or some nerd but he was uh, married twice had 10 children and so he was um, 
uh, yeah, he was a, a very active person and he uh, was a teacher in schools and, and he wrote many school books and earned a lot, a lot of money with his school books. But then um, he, uh, he, he, with the money he earned, uh, he could fulfill his dream and buy this house in south of France where he studied insects whole day and wrote his books all night. And so that was uh, his dream to live like that. <laughs> And it sounds like I guess they turned his house and gardens into a museum. Yes, you know it's I would. Near, love have you been near, there? No, no. It's near Orange. I've been there once uh, when I was a, a child, but we didn't go there. But I've seen pictures, um, photographs, and it looks nice. <laughs> I would like to go there. Um, oh. Yeah, let's go to. Yeah, I tend to jump around if that's okay. I go from one place. No problem. To but you know you talk about because it's it's one of the things you say that everybody tends to believe that a cockroaches could survive a direct nuclear blast which your colleague of course says no but so talk about the but as far as that um climate uh, lack of food how mm. resilient they are compared to us yeah i think cockroaches are true survivors yeah that's what makes them so, yeah, so strong. And, and um, they are cockroaches since 300 million years. And for example, they, they have special um, bacteria in their guts and um, they help them to build um, more complex biological molecules out of something like, I don't know, um, um, they can feed from nearly everything I want to say, yes. And, and then um, I think that the reason for this story is about that they can survive a nuclear war came up after the, the, the nuclear explosions in Japan, because after a while you could see them around there quite soon and, and people maybe have thought they could survive the explosion, but I think that's um, that's a myth because you can't uh, even uh, every every uh, every animal or plant can survive these temperatures and pressure and stuff like that. But what small animals with a, a short lifespan are less vulnerable to um, radiation because where we live maybe 20, 30, 40 years before we get children. And in that time, all these mutations can happen. And so many, many animals are more, less, are less vulnerable to radiation, but not only cockroach. So a world after a big nuclear war would be a world maybe without humans or any or many other mammals, but with many insects and and other uh, small animals with a short lifespan. Yeah, it's interesting because people always say that we're destroying the planet. It's not really true because we would be gone, but the planet would be fine. It would just take some time, and then maybe cockroaches would rule the world. But um, do you think do you think evolution kind of said three hundred million years ago? hey, these guys are fine. I'm going to go work on something else because I really don't have to do anything else with the cockroaches. They're fine the way they are. You know, evolution doesn't have any aim. It's just chance. Something develops and this creature is good in getting resources, food or places to hide. Um, places to lay their eggs and so this creature is um, yeah has success and something else is not good and will die out that's normal that's nature but um, when everything changes a lot yeah then many life forms die out and we have this big extinctions we had several times during during the history of our earth. And right now, humans, yeah, 
they they cause the next big wave of extinction and we are yeah we are uh, right inside that and and so i think but but this this world this post human world i don't know when it will be will be a world where a cockroach has a better chance than maybe uh, a chimpanzee or or an orangutan yeah because um uh, we build a world that is good for cockroach and bad for many other animals. But um, you can't tell. I don't know what the future will bring, but we have to, if we want to, 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 yeah, to have uh, um, all the animals we love, we have to change our behavior. Yeah. So it's somewhat pessimistic for me because we have to do it soon and I don't see that happening, but be mm. that as it may. One of the things that are, is really interesting about your, your time in South America is kind of following this path when you're, when you're driving in that truck with all your supplies and you're thinking you're gonna be passing through rainforests, but a lot of them were decimated. So you're mm. just you're open fields until you get to your goal. But that must have been depressing when you you thought you'd see something and then you realize what mankind had had done there. Yes, sure. You have to know I, my my biggest dream since I was a child was to get to the jungle one time, to be a biologist in the jungle. And um, and I tried to um, to study that way that uh, I finally get there. And then I got there and then I had to realize that what we think about jungle and rainforest is maybe not the true thing yes it is um we don't uh, live in a world where yeah where everything stays the same and um, and so our culture has gone further and further and further and in this yeah wilderness gets smaller and smaller and smaller but on the other other hand i i believe that everybody can make the same mistakes like we did yeah we in 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 whole europe you don't have any any primary forest left it is all culture we have changed everything and uh, and so the people over there they maybe do the same mistakes and you can say yes preserve as much as you can but um but yeah it's it's the way it is yes but uh, there are on the other hand there are many people who try to bring back forests i've worked a lot in costa rica for a film some years ago and there you find the situation that the 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 forest is coming back because of really really interesting and intelligent um, programs they're doing there so I don't want to always say that's bad, that's bad. People get dull if you uh, dull if you only tell the bad stories. You have to tell stories of hope too, and and there are many people who do the right thing. And I try to do this in the book too to show that people outside, out there, are trying to bring it back, and it's possible. Yeah, you have to do it. A couple of times in the book, especially at the beginning when you were, not because you wanted to, but because it was the beginning of your career and you were working to, to uh, find the pharaohs or the specific chemical compounds that would create a, a pesticide that would be used to eradicate cockroaches. I thought about that. And I thought also about when you went and your friend, because it's really difficult to climb into the canopy of the rainforest. So he sprayed upward. And the most fascinating thing about that was how many species, new species, mm. almost sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Not me did that. that I know was, bear, bear. That so. was Terry Irving, a very famous scientist who wanted to show how many species lived there in the jungle, and so he did this um, method called fogging, where he used pesticides. Uh, I didn't do that, but I know, it, I know, mm. but. But how many species did he discover just from that one fogging? Yeah, he, he did it like this. He, he fogged only uh, some uh, 
I don't know how many trees of one species. And then he collected everything what came down and most of it were, um, were um, beetles. And, and he realized that only in this species, he found more than 1,000, I don't know the, the numbers, thousands of different species of beetles. And so he calculated, he said, okay, one species, there are many specialists that only live in one or some species only of trees. And so uh, he knew that there are uh, around 40,000 tree species uh, around the world. And so he multiplied. And in the end, he said there could be 20 to 40 million species of insects in the tropical forests only. And at that time, only 1 million was discovered and had a name. And so that's the factor what we are deal dealing with. Um, when you go to the jungle, you wrap somewhere, bring out some insects, and it's two pages of your PhD thesis because it's new. Yeah, everything is new. When you go there, every species you catch is new. If you don't catch butterflies, they're well known. Yeah, and and this diversity—that's the wonder, and that's the big question. All the biologists that go that go to the tropics, they have the same questions: Why are there so many species? And that's. Uh, what I try to work on too. So none of these species, if, if I understand how this process works, they can't uh, mate with each other and produce viable offspring, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the definition of a species. Yeah. Is, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was going to say, is that because their DNA is not similar enough? Yeah. It, yes. In the end, it's like that. But you have to imagine like that. You, um, there's one chapter in the book where I try to describe it. You, there, there is a species of, of grasshopper who has green or red legs. And the green legs are only on one side of a big jungle river, the Rio Napo, and the other ones are on the other side. And this river divides the population in two. And so they don't interbreed anymore. And there's something we call genetical shift. They have mutations and their genomes, they shift from each other. And if there is some day where this uh, river will disappear and they try to mate again, they may be two species and they are not compatible uh, anymore. But also their, their genitals, differ maybe they don't fit to together that uh, can happen and uh, or um, or their behavior has changed so the mating song of a cricket has maybe changed and the female doesn't understand it anymore so that's why they don't mate anymore yeah they're so but in the end there will be differences in the uh, genetic um, molecules yes yeah when you talked about when you were in the field and you you went to the the volleyball field because you couldn't that noise was so loud but at the mm -hmm. same time you also talked about how in one area there be so many species that the sound that the cricket made would be slightly different and i always wonder how is it possible that each female can discern between mm -hmm. what is the biological and neurological process that allows that such a subtle distinction to be made by one species. Yes, yes, it's there are so many wonders about insects because I don't know how many neurons they have, but I think a human has a million times more. I don't know. Yeah. So maybe they are in a in an insect brain. I, I don't want to say any number, but it's much less than we have. But some specialized behavior of them is very complex. So it, it functions maybe a little bit differently. You have, um, you have a song and the female will react and she will turn to this song and she will run there. That's, that, is, um, that is not very complex, but you have to design a brain that can, you, can do that, yes? And, but you have other um, insects that do different insane things, yeah, like 
like we mentioned before, the digger wasps that hunt other insects and sting them to paralyze them and bring them to their young and, and lay an egg there. That is, it's amazing. And it's everything is in the genes in the end because they don't teach their young to do that. They can, they can do it. Yeah. So that's uh, that's a, the big wonder, yes. And and you know, I'm I'm not very religious, but there are people who say uh, that is a proof for religion or for God that you find everything in so little things, yeah. And uh, but but as me, who somebody who believes in evolution. Uh, has to make some proof that this can evolve from uh, a creature that lived before that did it a little bit different and then you find um, maybe existing crickets who who do it a little bit different and you can do like a row that, where you can show it evolved from here and now we are there and now we have this very very uh, amazing behavior and it's only done by insects who have little little little, little brains and and who am, can do amazing things yeah and that's the big wonder and that's what amazes me about animals that have um yeah that are unpopular yeah it's you can write a book about horses or cats or dogs um and and it's interesting but um but people don't know much about the millions of insects and all the millions the sto of stories they tell us about life. And that goes back to, you know, this idea of, for want of a better word, disgust. Because if you go back to even ancient Egypt and spirits to ward off cockroaches and the fact that there's even a named, I don't know if I can pronounce it right, Ketsaridophobia. Um, that there's a named fear of cockroaches. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost as if it's like we were talking about. It. It's almost as if it's, as we would say here, hardwired. It's almost as if you have this instant aversion. But I don't know why that is. Because if you look at a cockroach and a cricket, like you say, there isn't that much difference. Maybe yes. this is the word that your translator uses, this skittering. And the mm -hmm. fact that you don't know they're there until you realize, as as you say, if you see one cockroach. Mm. I don't know. Maybe it's culture. You know, um, the the German cockroach, Blattella germanica. It's the species I worked on. Yeah, and why does it carry this name, the German cockroach? Is it from Germany? No, uh, because it 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 carries that name because Karl von Linné, uh, the big uh, biologist gave this species the name because in Sweden, where he lived, they were called German cockroach because everybody hated German people there. And in south uh, of Germany, they were called the Prussians because everybody called, uh, hated the Prussians. So, and and everybody thinks that cockroach are, which they are, that they are filthy animals because they live on their feces, they go inside where our food is, we fear that they make us sick, and that's that are fears that are really okay to have, yes. And um, and I think another thing is they are very qu quick and they move around very quickly, and you always fear that they maybe go inside your clothing or something like that. So, but they aren't dangerous at all, they, they can't sting, they can't bite. They don't have poison. They don't have sharp teeth. So um, this is very cultural and very subjective. Our fears against cockroach, I think. But uh, I think when you ask people, it's maybe the, the least popular species on Earth. And uh, that's why it, it makes it fascinating, fascinating thinking about it and writing a book about it and, and spending one one year of your life uh, with them, yes. Well, and that's the other thing you said about the book being humorous. And as a bookseller, um, I think that's a very good way to sell a book because when there's humor in it, you, you, you tend to want to go further quicker. 
mm. because you're laughing or there's something funny and all your stories are like that, which is great. But um, as you were saying, I mean, the mosquito is the most dangerous uh, yeah. creature on the planet in terms of death of human beings. But yeah, we don't like them, but we don't have that instant repulsion of them. We just, but yeah, like you had your mosquito netting in, in the rainforest. You needed it. Because, but yeah, it, it really is interesting because I've thought about it a lot before the book and especially after the book. Um, and the fact that your friends uh, wanted to rely on you to help them eradicate you know, this pest and, and they call on you. Tell, tell the story about how um, the movies and how you loaned out your cockroaches. Uh, okay, yes. Um, you know, when I worked on cockroaches, I was like, I don't know, 24 and doing the, the diploma thesis and I didn't earn much money at that time. And, uh, and one, one day a friend called me and said, you 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 have these cockroaches in, in 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 the university. I need some, and um, I realized he started to work at a music t television station like like MTV German one Viva, and he said he had this idea to make a little uh, little films uh, like like um, American sitcoms with uh, people telling bad jokes and laughter from. Uh, from the off, uh, um, and and so he asked me, "Can you can you give me some cockroaches to film this?" And I said, "I don't want to give you the German cockroach I, I worked on. I want to don't want to infest your the whole TV studio work on." But uh, we had a yeah we we were um, we had some Madagascar um, cockroach which were that size. And they can make noise like 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 an angry cat and and I told him take these ones it's easier to film them and uh, and they don't run away and um, they uh, they are not not uh, like the other ones and and so I I gave them to him and they filmed them they built a house and they had some chairs and tables and stuff like that in the house and they. They used um, sewing, uh, Fred. yeah, to, to to make them sitting in in these chairs, and and then they were up um, and with with bad jokes and laughter, and, and so that was quite fun, and uh, and I earned some money by renting cockroaches, and I think I am one of the few persons worldwide who uh, earned his money like that. <laughs> I like the way they return them to you unharmed. They give them back. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, they they didn't harm them, and and we met on the parking lot of of my university, but because nobody knew that I made some extra money, and and uh, I gave him the the cockroaches. He gave me two hundred German D mark, and uh, and then uh, afterwards he brought back, and I put them back in in this the the, the tank where we raised them. <laughs> it sounds like a drug deal. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, cockroach trafficking. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because, you know, I know when you were a kid, you gravitated towards interesting creatures, whether it was snakes or lizards or things like that. But you started out trying to study hummingbirds, but then that fell through. And so this is what you fell into. But you seem to have such a passion for it. How come for all this time since you were an adult, since you just became an adult, how come you still do, do you still have this passion for these creatures? Yes, but you know, I never, I, I had pets as a child. My, my parents had, had um, dogs and had, I, I had little tanks with uh, toads and I had um, some turtles and stuff like that. But as an adult, I don't want to have pets because um, they, I, I have family, um, but but uh, it's, I want to have my freedom and, and a pet, yeah, it's, it's something I have to uh, take care about. And so um, my enthusiasm is more more here, yeah? And, and I, I like to go out 
to go in the forest and and if I, I see a bird or I see a lizard, I, I, I yeah, I have this feeling of, of um, yeah, I'm lucky to, to see it. And, um, and yes, on, a, on the other hand, it's like I said before, it's um, many people, yeah, when they think about animals, they think about cute creatures with big eyes and furry and and stuff like that. And I'm I was always excited excited by things that are different from normal from us. Yeah, um, uh, we I I looked in into I looked for things that are different. Uh, when I was a, a child, like many young boys, my my first drug were uh, dinosaurs because they looked very different very powerful and 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 so i i learned to love reptiles going through that and um, and my 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 most favorite uh, creature was the komodo lizard and, and 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 stuff like that because it reminded me on uh, dinosaurs so yeah, that's uh, what makes my passion is uh, the, to, to find out interesting stories about animals that function differently from us. <laughs> I bet you, you know, I have friends, you're talking about dogs. I have friends and I say, do you want to take a ski trip maybe for just a long weekend? And they'll say, no, I have, I have to take care of the dogs. I can't mm. leave. Have you, do you have friends like that? And it's like my, my brother-in-law he couldn't come on a vacation because he had to stay home with the dogs. Because we have to be careful. There, there are many people who love their dogs so much, so they don't like us to to speak like we do right now. Yeah, but um, yes, it's true though. I, I I can understand it, and especially old people who maybe are alone, and and it's it's nice to have a pet. But it's different for me. I I I have other. Yeah. Oh, well, that's interesting because I was just thinking about that. My brother was saying, "Oh, he loves his dogs, and he's worried that they'll die." Yeah, I think he loves them more than me. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it's this idea. People think oh, your dog is giving you unconditional love, which is what yeah. everybody wants. But then you look at an insect. No, they they really don't give a shit what you're doing or it's like cats cats don't mm -hmm. care about you they just where's my food but there is something about that idea of unconditional love and in your area maybe people are somewhat repulsed because they're not going to get any empathy or emotion back from the creature i never thought of that yes there are some theories why we think some some um, animals are disgusting and one theory, theory is um, that we learn to find something disgusting that doesn't help us, that has no, there's no reason to collect insects for eating in Europe. In other regions, it's okay. And in these regions, these insects aren't disgusting to the people because you can feed on them. Yeah, but you waste your time when you try to feed on on insects in Europe. So everybody says, don't care about insects, care about other things. And and you have some creatures that yeah that are like friends. A dog is like a friend. He 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 helps you to uh, to to hunt animals. He helps you to protect your house. Uh, so I can understand that you have a human-like love for this creature but and as a biologist you you shouldn't have this kind of of love for a cockroach yeah it's uh i can understand that there's a different and i don't want to change people and and make them love but they should change in a in a different way they sh should i think only things that you can understand you can protect yeah when you um when you have a forest and you say oh, oh, oh different maybe you decide to to protect bears or wolves you can't protect them without their habitat and in their habitat this habitat only functions with all the insects with all the plants with 
with bacteria, with viruses, with everything. You need everything to protect the lion or the elephant or, yeah. And so one is nothing without the other things. So you have this holistic view on nature. You have to have it if you want to protect it. And so you need to study all the stories of bugs and beetles and flies and wasps and everything, yeah, and jellyfish and disgusting things um, that live inside other animals, yeah, um, to understand how nature works. And, and, and if you want to protect it, you have to make some thoughts about animals like that. <laughs> yeah, that third line at the beginning of the book and the foreword is where <laughs> what they say, they're they're of no use. What use are they? And then there's a paragraph which says, yeah, they are use because they fit into the entire web of what you just discussed. And then in the end of the book, <clears throat> I forgot who you were talking about, who said it was maybe a corporation or something that said they were trying to save the bees. And you mm -hmm. seem encouraged by that. So I guess I would ask you, because I am pessimistic, are you pessimistic or cautiously optimistic that mankind still has time to either stop or reverse or ameliorate to make a little bit better our situation? Because I'm afraid. Mm. Past mm. And it's a very hard question <laughs> to, to, to answer. I think, yes, you have to be pessimistic because it's disgusting how many species are wiped out, how the climate is changing and how we live over our resources and stuff like that. But on the other hand, you have to be optimistic if you want to try to save something. If you, you can say, okay, there can be a world without human beings. Yeah, there will be some creatures be left and there will be a, a evolution of new things and uh, a world without humans is possible. That's no problem. Yeah. But then you start to think about your son, your grandchildren, your friends, your yeah, and and uh, and so you we have to be kind of optimistic and and I think with the climate it's very hard yeah it's very hard to stop flying, driving cars, eating meat and stuff like that. It's that's the hard one. But with the biodiversity. It's easy, yeah, but you have to start it. We know everything, we know what to do. We can start it from the next day, create um, insect-friendly garden. We can uh, save the jungle, we can reforest, uh, um, we can do so many things and it's we know what to do. And if everybody starts, um, it's possible to, to save uh, species and it is done you know there are some species what were almost wiped out and they are back right now like for example in the united states the bison uh, the big buffaloes or other example in in europe it's the wolf it's coming back uh, we have so many wolves back in germany and so there are positive um examples and uh, and if you use them as an example you can change it starting the next day so in that field i'm more optimistic than in this climate change field and yes they are connected and uh, but but uh, for example there are many birds species of birds are declining in europe but right now it's it's mostly the common birds. And some rare bird species, they are going up because people had, had understood to protect them and now they're coming back. And, and so the, the, more, the, the, the more common species, they're going down because of our form of agriculture and, and stuff like that. But, but you know, you have to look on every species and you can do something most of the times. And your second <clears throat> second career in which you're making nature movies and, mm. and stuff like that, they're beautiful. 
<clears throat> and wonderful to see because you're learning things you didn't know before. But isn't that also a good way to show people? You know, sure, yeah. sure. And, and uh, I'm working for a company in Cologne called Lengengrad Film Production, um, and our our approach to these kind of movies uh, is to make them more journalistic. Um, we don't want to tell fairy tales of untouched nature and and uh, harmony and paradise and stuff like that. When we when I make a film about the Andes in in South America, I show that there are people living nearby and they have to live and they have maybe found a way to live together with nature. And that's for me the more interesting story. Or I've made a film about a vegetable garden where we show that it is possible to um, uh, to have insects in your garden and still have uh, 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 many fruits go growing there and vegetables. Yeah, and uh, and we we try to film the insects that live there with macro and uh, um, uh, macro uh, filming and very fancy cameras. And it's 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 a great film, but it's not a fairy tale about some I don't know lions in the Serengeti without any problems, but um, that's not our cup of tea. <laughs> so have you, um, I guess kind of in conclusion, do you still do some research with regard to other animals or is it you mostly devoted to filmmaking and other things? Yes, yes, I, I stopped to be um, a scientist. I'm still a biology of my heart, <laughs> um, but, I realized that I'm not the type of guy who makes a good career in university. I, um, I'm too lazy for that. <laughs> and uh, and um, my job is hard too, and, uh, it's, um, but uh, it's different. And, and yes, and I think I can reach more people with my information using film or books uh, working as a journalist or filmmaker than I could when I worked in uh, in university, but I still admire people who do that. Um, and and we can't do these films without them. We read something and we say, okay, that's very interesting. We want to film that. So they do the hard work and we maybe do the yeah glorious <laughs> uh, work where we have millions of viewers and, and but we couldn't do it without them no yeah well it sounds like <clears throat> your life has been like my father always said it should be it seems like every day you've woken up and you've wanted to go to work and yeah yeah it's like that yes but sometimes i like to just stay at home and be lazy too yes <laughs> oh, and yeah. um, yes and there was one uh, one thing I wanted to say. Where, yeah, I'm. I think I'm a little bit like an insect <laughs> that, that that changes its uh, skin every seven years. And I I I did that. I um, I studied biology. Then I I worked um, as a cultural journalist afterwards. Then I changed to filmmaking. And so um, I I think that's that's something nice. Uh, with journalism because every year I start a new film pro project and so you you have to find out how it works you have to read a lot and and you so you um yeah it's not the same every day you really change uh what what uh what you're thinking about and uh, you meet new people that's that's a great job <laughs> no think about my job I mean you're like I'm almost up to a thousand interviews and each mm -hmm. time I learn, it's almost like being in graduate school because each time you learn something new, you do your sure. research and then you speak to nice people and meet new people every week. So yeah. yes. And I have a look at all this, uh, um, books behind yeah. you. Yeah. You have made thousands of interviews and you have read even more books and sold them and brought them to people. And then that's great. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure talking to you today, Frank. I really appreciate you writing the book. It'll be in our store on our front table. And yes, you have to you have to see these are my 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 little oh. kid. That's the German one, and that's the translation that's now sold um, 
in the US and um, it's great that you help a little bit to make it um, yeah, a, bit, a little bit more known to the people and uh, I really appreciate your work, that's great. <laughs> And, and thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a luck. Bye-bye.